Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Jessica Kimball Johnson. I'm the director of research here at the Karsh Institute of Democracy. I also help to run our NOW Lab on the history and principles of democracy, which is supporting today's event in partnership with UVA's uh, College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. I am delighted to introduce another conversation that is part of our Touchstones of Democracy series. The series focuses on key events, places, thinkers, and texts that help us understand democracy. Today's topic is on economic policy and the shaping of American democracy. With economic issues and inflation in particular, a major theme of the 2024 US presidential election, we thought that today's conversation would be particularly timely. And uh, we wanted to focus on the ideas in Kerala's new book, Shock Values, Prices and Inflation in American Democracy. So we'll have time at around the 45 minute mark for audience questions for, for the two of you. And Kerala's book is uh, for sale um, just outside the doors. So I'll now introduce our UVA moderator for today, and then he'll in introduce our invited speaker. Mike Lennox is the Taylor Murphy Professor of Business Administration at the Darden School of Business at UVA. His areas of interest include business strategy, innovation and entrepreneurship, digital transformation, and business and sustainability. He wears many hats, <laughs> including leading a new pan-university entrepreneurship initiative, alongside serving as a director of the Democracy and Capitalism Program at UVA. He received his PhD from MIT, and his primary expertise is in technology strategy and policy. He's interested in the role of innovation and entrepreneurship for economic growth and firm competitive success. His research has appeared in over 30 refereed academic publications, and he's been cited in numerous media outlets, including the New York Times, the Financial Times, and The Economist. He's also published five books, including Strategy in the Digital Age by Stanford University Press. He was named a faculty pioneer by the Aspen Institute and one of the top 40 business professors under 40 by Poets and Quants. We've got a rock star here. <laughs> Thank you for coming here today. I have to laugh. The, the, the 40 under 40 was many years ago at this point. Uh, so yeah, but I appreciate it. I appreciate the call out on, on that one there. Well, uh, uh, thank you for that introduction. But really, the, the, the star of the show here is sitting next to me to my left here. Really excited to have uh, Carola Binder with us. Carola is a associate professor of civic leadership and economics at the University of Texas. Uh, she's also a research associate at the MBER, if you're familiar with that organization. Uh, she has her PhD in economics from the UC, uh, UC Berkeley. And is, she is the author of what is a fabulous new book, uh, <laughs> Shock Values. So, so Carol, I had the opportunity to read your book over Labor Day weekend while I was sitting at the beach. Uh, my wife was giving me a hard time. She's like, this is your light reading for the beach. But in all truthfulness, maybe it just says something about me, but it is, it is a real page turner. And it, it tells just some amazing stories historically going back all the way to the founding of this country and just working us through chapter by chapter these bouts with inflation that we have faced and how it has affected our politics and how it's affected the policies and the institutions we put in place. So congratulations. It is amazing book and I really highly recommend it to everyone. Thank you so much. You're, the, you're welcome. The original cover design that was proposed was supposed to be um, pink and yellow and I turned it down but it would have made for a better beach read. And you're, you're That's right. right. My wife might not have noticed that. You know, I could tell her it's the new, I don't know, some uh, new f you know, fiction book. Um, so to start off with, just a level set for everyone here. Okay. Can you just explain why inflation and, and, and more broadly as you talk about price fluctuations are so disruptive, disruptive economically and disruptive politically uh, in our society. Sure, so price fluctuations, whether that's rising prices like inflation or falling prices, deflation, um, they tend to cause a lot of social problems because they affect different groups of people um, in different ways. So around the time of the country's founding, the real big way that they affected different groups um, was because of the way that farmers, who were a big share of the country's population, um, tended to be debtors. So since farmers had these nominal debts that they owed, um, if you had um, high inflation, that would actually kind of, it would help the farmers because it would reduce the value of their debt. Um, if you had deflation, it would hurt the farmers because it would increase the value of their debt. So price fluctuations um, 
tend to just change, they help um, creditors and debtors in different ways, and it, and it tends to lead to a lot of unrest and calls for the government to do something, Yeah. right? And, but what is the government actually going to do? What can they do? Um, those kinds of questions, you know, come up and usually the government tries to do something more. So like they're expanding their role and that leads to political controversy. Um, it leads to constitutional um, issues coming up. So that's one reason why it's like politically, um, why, why there can be this big political impact of price fluctuations. Um, but yeah, inflation, the other reason why inflation tends to be costly is because um, of the uncertainty that it brings about. So if inflation were, if we knew for sure that inflation was going to be 10% every year, um, that, that might not be that bad because we could plan for it. If we knew, okay, it's just going to be exactly 10%. Um, you can just work that into your wage demands. You can work that into the um, interest rates you're charging and so on. But higher inflation tends to also mean more volatile inflation, harder to predict inflation. So there's all sorts of uncertainty about um, what real value are you actually going to need to pay back? What's your real wage actually going to be? Um, it makes it really hard for people to plan. You can make um, mistakes as far as your investments, your spending, your labor market decisions. I do find in this current epoch of inflation that we just have kind of been through, mm -hmm. how um, the popular press and maybe individuals don't understand what inflation means. There's this notion like inflation is coming back, therefore the prices are going to come back to where they were, you know, five years ago, rather than this notion of like, no, this is where prices are going to be probably for, you know, the foreseeable future here. Yeah, so the, the confusion between the price level and the inflation rate, yeah, yeah I think we are seeing that right now. Um, inflation is back down to somewhere near 2%. That doesn't mean prices are falling. It just means that they're rising at a slower rate. Yeah. But if people think, well, you know, grocery prices are a lot higher than I paid um, three years ago, so inflation is high. Well, grocery prices are just going to be higher. Right. They're not coming back down. They're just going to grow more slowly. Yeah, exactly. Now, as I said, your book uh, covers these epochs in inflation through our history. Uh, maybe to start off with just briefly, uh, uh, let's talk about the, the founding kind of error here. Uh, we have these classic debates between Hamilton and Jefferson. We actually had an event a few months ago uh, debating their perspectives on the economy. But can you maybe just start with that kind of initial bouts of inflation we faced as a country uh, and how, how those were perceived and kind of politically adjudicated? Sure. So um, you've probably heard the, the phrase, not worth a continental, or maybe mm. you've, I don't know, I asked my students, and they had not heard that phrase. <laughs> um, but there is a phrase called not worth a continental, which means worth basically nothing. And that's referring to the, um, the episode of inflation that we had during the Revolutionary War. So during the Revolutionary War, um, Congress printed this paper money called continentals, the continental dollar. Um, and, um, yeah, because of the amount that they printed, there was um, eventually inflation. Now, at the time, um, there was a lot of, well, there was recognition that there was going to be inflation, even though we didn't have um, an official government agency measuring it. People still knew that it was happening. And there was recognition that it was probably going to be a problem. Um, so one idea was, well, if we don't want prices to rise, so we just need to say that prices can't rise. So price <laughs> controls, right? Um, the, there was several you know, reasons why that was not um, able to be implemented very effectively. One is that um, they, they had to be imposed at the local level, right? There wasn't a strong enough national government to say, OK, you know, prices of wheat can only be this level across all of the colonies. So if, if they're implemented at the local level, then it's really easy to circumvent them. You know, if there's a, a price ceiling on wheat in your town and you want to sell your wheat for higher, you can just go over to the next town. So um, they couldn't really effectively um, or kind of practically implement price controls. And also the founders just felt um, very uncomfortable with the ideas with the idea of imposing them because they were really influenced by um, John Locke's philosophy, which is about um, consent-based legitimacy. And they recognized that with price controls, 
you're like forcing a seller to sell their stuff at a price that they don't want to sell it at. And they just saw that as you know, not a legitimate thing for the government to do. Um, so there was this um, inflation, and they, they recognized like, it's only going to really um, come down after the war when we stop with this monetary expansion, mm. which it did. And that caused its own problems. Right? There was this post-war deflation. And um, I mentioned the farmers earlier. These farmers who were war veterans, they had bought, um, taken out loans to buy land during the war when they saw prices rising and they expected them to keep rising. But after the war, when there was um, deflation, they suddenly were like thrown, thrown into debtor's prison. Right? They couldn't pay back their loans. The land that they had um, taken out the loans to buy was falling in value. So, um, so yeah, they. Of course, this was very upsetting, and it even led to like an armed uprising called Shays Rebellion. So, right at the start, you know, as the the founders are like sitting down to frame the constitution, they've seen how destructive big price fluctuations can be, whether it's inflation or whether it's deflation. Yeah. So, so if we do a quick run through history. Think about like the next 150 years okay. here of the U.S. Uh, this is a tall order. But can we talk about what were some of the institutional responses, the, the things that were created in the wake of these various inflationary episodes? Let's go up to the Great Depression. So if you kind of go from the founding up to the Great Depression, you've got three minutes to give us, okay. you know, this long history here. So, but. sure. I would say that um, each time there was some war. There tended to be um, inflation brought about by the war and some post-war deflation. The post-war deflation always hurt the farmers and always prompted calls for some sort of policy response. And ten these tended to fall into like three main categories. So one would be um, fiscal policy, which at the time mainly meant tariffs, which is like um, the farmers would say, look, or sometimes the manufacturers would say um, prices are falling because foreigners are producing things more cheaply. We need a tariff to raise prices so that we get higher prices for the stuff we're selling. Um, the next would be regulatory policy, so controls or antitrust. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the third would be monetary policy. So for most of that, those 150 years that you asked me to talk about, the US was on either a gold or a bimetallic standard where the dollar was defined in terms, in terms of a fixed weight of gold and or silver. Um, so that really put constraints on, um, on the money supply. The government couldn't just expand the money supply very easily. Um, but there were calls for the government to basically um, have more ability to expand the money supply. So in times when the US was just on gold, it was, let's monetize silver as well. Or it was, let's, um, let's start using greenbacks. Let's start um, having paper currency so that we can con conduct more active monetary policy. And usually these calls came during times of deflation when the idea was, um, let's expand the money supply either with silver or with greenbacks or paper money. Um, the Federal Reserve was founded in um, 1913 with the Federal mm -hmm. Reserve Act. So you, I think you asked about institutions. That would be the, the most important one to talk about in my, and probably already over That's OK. <laughs> I'll give you some slack on that. But, um, but the Federal Reserve was created to, uh, to be the central bank for the United States. It wasn't created with a, any kind of mandate for stabilizing prices, although a, a very influential economist named Irving Fisher wanted that to be the case. And it almost became the case that the Fed was created with some mandate to stabilize prices. Instead, when the Fed was created, the US was still on the gold standard. So, the, um, so that meant the Fed couldn't just use monetary policy to say, we're going to keep prices stable, or we're going to have inflation be 2%. They still had to maintain the convertibility of dollars to gold at, at a fixed rate. And in fact, World War I started right after the Fed was created. And during that time, they were just supporting the Treasury and just keeping interest rates um, fixed at a, low, um, at a low rate. So even if they had wanted to try to use interest rate policy to stabilize prices, they couldn't have done it because of the way they were subservient to the Treasury. 
Interesting. So, so now we're getting to the Great Depression in World War II, seminal mm -hmm. moments, uh, obviously huge economic impact. Tell us a little bit about that period, what was tried, what worked, and how that kind of transformed sure. things. Yeah. So um, the Great Depression and also the Depression of 1920, 1921, um, they had a lot in common. So in both cases, there, there was kind of concern about speculation in the stock market and um, a lot of arguments between the Fed and the Treasury and the Federal Reserve Banks about what the Fed should do. And in both cases, the Fed eventually increased the discount rate, which was the interest rate that they were using. And then in both cases, that prompted a big um, recession with a lot of deflation. And in both cases, you know, again, the farmers said, we need some sort of protection. We need monetary expansion. We need, um, we need some tariffs. We need some regulations. <coughs> Um, in the case of the Great Depression, of course, the, the magnitude was just much greater. Um, and so all of these kinds of policies um, were tried eventually um, by, um, by the time of Roosevelt's um, New Deal. They Im imposed all sorts of um, regulatory policies, tariffs, but also um, Roosevelt eventually devalued the dollar took the U.S. off the gold standard, and that allowed for um, monetary expansion um, to try to counter the deflation. Yeah. Um, that whole episode also kind of, um, there, there were all these Supreme Court cases saying, OK, well, is, is what Roosevelt's doing actually um, constitutional or not? And the court tended to take a pretty, um, like a pretty broad view of, of the different powers that the president had that allowed his New Deal policies to, um, to be maintained. So it, it just kind of changed what the public viewed as the role of the government in trying to stabilize the macro economy. Now, during this time period, was the Fed still had some independence from the presidency, or was it more maybe well, conflated than um, what we take today? Well, not exactly. So um, that interest rate peg that the Fed followed during World War I, um, it was it was still assumed that they would do what the Treasury wanted after World War I, and then they used an interest rate peg again in World War II. In that period in between them, and around the, um, the Great Depression, um, when, when Roosevelt uh, was given a lot, a lot more monetary powers with, with the Thomas Inflation Amendment, um, he, it was sort of like he had, Congress gave him the power to issue greenbacks if he wanted, or um, you know, to do all sorts of expansionary monetary policy if he wanted. He didn't want to outright say, OK, I'm going to use this power. Like, I'm going to um, print greenbacks. But because the Fed knew that he could if he wanted to, the Fed kind of had to do what they thought Roosevelt wanted them to mm -hmm. do. So it was, um, yeah, it was the, I think the Fed did not have what we would think of as central bank independence in that period. Um, it might have sort of looked like they did, but they also knew that um, that they had to do kind of what the Roosevelt administration would want them to. So continuing our walk, walk through history, now we're in the post-World War II period, and uh, the 50s and 60s, uh, huge economic growth period in the United States. What was happening in terms of oh. inflation and monetary policy? So we're like, we're going to skip World War II. Oh, okay. No, so, yeah, cover World War II. That's an important important <laughs> yeah, one World there. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> World War II, the... I think the important thing to talk about there is the price controls. Yeah. Because they were, like I mentioned, they were attempted during the Revolutionary War, but not very broadly. Um, just at the local level, the prices of some goods um, would, would be controlled. They weren't even tried during like the War of 1812 and the Civil War. There just wasn't um, kind of the um, public appetite for them or the, the belief that they would be effective or the belief that they could be legitimate. Um, they were tried again in World War I at a much, um, much broader level than they had been during the Revolutionary War. Um, but still, um, not, it wasn't like a total, total system of controls the way it eventually became in World War II. So during World War II, um, when war broke out in Europe, the totalitarian countries imposed price controls pretty quickly. And you know, the US 
knew this, but they wanted to, um, they didn't want to have to resort to something like what the totalitarian governments were doing. They didn't want to have to resort to total um, controls. So they tried to, you know, do some sort of partial system and make it, make it seem kind of voluntary. Let's, can the government like talk with industry and get them to voluntarily agree to some controls? And, um, you know, when, when these voluntary, when they couldn't come to a voluntary agreement, though, the government might just seize your, your product. So, you know, they would say, we're, we're doing price controls through voluntary agreements, but you, you had to voluntarily make that agreement. Um, <laughs> voluntary, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there was a few years of these, um, this like partial system of controls where um, the, there are voluntary agreements, there are controls on certain products, um, and they might not be a dollar cap. It might be like you can only um, charge this much percent higher than you charged in this previous period, and so then there could be some wiggle room or, you know, if you, but if you didn't sell that product in the previous period, you could find a similar product. And so there was a lot of, like, room for, um, room for getting around the controls. So they, they didn't really hold down inflation because, um, you know, if you just control a couple of prices, then and people still have all this money that they're wanting to spend, it's going to just rise the price of other goods. Um, so you know, you, you continue having inflation, and remember, the Fed is still just holding interest rates <coughs> low to support the Treasury. Um, so the controls just get more and more um, broad and like firm. Roosevelt mm -hmm. issued the Hold the Line order, which basically is like we're holding the line on price increases, mm -hmm. um, and they start, um, you know, having dollar limits for what can actually be charged on things. And so eventually, once you have the economy like fully under controls, price controls, wage controls, rent controls, <laughs> then inflation really is held down. Um, but yeah, after the victory with VJ Day, victory with Japan, um, they, they try to go back to the partial controls, and it's like you just... You were like covering up the sprinkler, right? And you take your hand off, and boom, the prices all start rising again. Yeah. So you have like the two on either end, this attempt at like, let's try to partially control the economy. And it doesn't work to hold down inflation at all. You can hold down inflation if you just really don't let any prices increase, um, but then it doesn't like hold down prices in the long run. And um, also, that, that period of like total control when inflation was held down, that required a huge um, expansion of the administrative state. And it required so much surveillance. Um, they had what were called the little OPAs. OPA is the Office of Price Administration, which was all the, the government bureaucrats managing the price controls. They were constantly criticized for being, um, you know, the the slide rule the slide rule boys and professors over at the OPA because the businessmen thought uh, these are just the slide rule boys. They like sit around <laughs> calculating yeah. and they don't really know what it's like to be a businessman. Um, they still feel that way. Just, you know, <laughs> but the little OPAs, these were the housewives. So in all the towns, they would, you know, conscript all the housewives to. You should go around to the grocery stores. You should check all the prices and report on anyone who's trying to, you know, get around hmm. the the price ceilings. And that's like that's your patriotic duty, right? Yeah. So there was, and people were motivated by by a sense of patriotism um, to do, to be part of it, um, and people were in support of the price controls, like in the middle of the war. Um, but it was it was um, after like when the war was over, and the, there was that like oh, but we still need price controls while we're getting back to our normal economy, or look how great this worked. We need more government um, management of the economy in normal times. That's when the public support for that really started um, wearing away, especially when um, one really important episode that lost public support was when there were meat shortages. Because hmm. the, the beef, um, beef sellers basically got into argument with Congress about price controls on beef, and so they decided we're just going to like withhold our product from mm -hmm. the market, and so consumers come and they want to buy beef, and those, those housewives who had been helping the OPA now say, we can't buy meat anymore, um, 
and that really like wore away. How long did that period take? Because I could understand that like we're all in together. It's World War II. We're going to accept these types of controls on the economy. Now we've had victory. Yeah. Some are arguing, let's keep it going. Others are saying, free it up. Like, was that a yeah, short I period of time, was, or did um, it play out over? <laughs> maybe like a year or so. I think oh, 1945, 46. Yeah. yeah, so it was a pretty short period before we kind of went back to a little more laissez-faire. Yeah, so, so different parts of the price control legislation had to be um, renewed and amended and things, mm -hmm. and they, um, as support for them fell, they eventually just didn't get... So now let's talk about that post-war period up sure. to, through like the 50s and 60s. Sure. What was happening then? Yeah, so I mean the Korean War, um, that was 1950-51. Um, already with that war, it was a lot harder to get public support for price controls. Um, it was hard on Congress. They, um, they were finding that there were all these like interest groups kind of lobbying for, for um, exceptions to the to price controls, so the different meat sellers would come and try to tell them why their um, cut of beef needed a higher price and so on. And it became just um, really hard to use price controls to, um, to manage wartime inflation. The Fed was still keeping interest rates low for the Treasury, um, and there was still a lot of um, fiscal spending because of the war. So, so, you know, the fiscal spending means we're going to have inflation. Um, if we can't use price controls, like, you kind of have to use monetary policy. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, that opened the door to, like, okay, we need to use monetary policy to stabilize inflation. Um, but the Fed was still being re restricted from doing so by the Treasury. Um, so it all came to a head in 1951 with the Fed Treasury Accord, which is... Um, usually the date that people give for saying when the Fed became independent. Mm -hmm. um, it, it wasn't like an on-off switch where the Fed wasn't independent and then they were independent forevermore. It was like they were given some amount of independence, um, but they, it's been a continual struggle um, to decide exactly what that is and to keep it. Yeah. Um, but that is when they started being able to use interest rate policy um, the way you would basically think of the Fed doing it today. And the Fed in the 1950s was um, behaving a lot like you would expect a, a pretty good central bank to behave. Um, so, you know, they, they knew that they needed to raise interest rates if they were expecting inflation to rise and, and lower them vice versa. They kind of knew that you couldn't um, try to exploit some kind of permanent trade-off between inflation and unemployment that monetary policy could only really affect um, prices in the long run, even if it could affect the real economy mm -hmm. in the short run. Um, so yeah, the Fed under Chairman Martin in the 1950s was doing you know, what, looking back, I think most economists agree, a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, in the, by the mid-1960s, that's when um, Milton Friedman was like sounding the alarm that the Fed was allowing too much monetary expansion um, and that's when I think the great inflation kind of got its start. Um, it, inflation wasn't really that high in the 60s, but it was kind of ticking upwards. Um, and the 70s is when it really started. Yeah, I, I put a, a personal twist on it and, and dating myself for sure. But um, I was born in the 70s, and I remember in the 80s as a teenager, my dad getting a job, another job in another state. He had accepted the job. We went down there. And this was when mortgage rates were at 14%. And they just realized, like, we can't afford as a family to make this move, so we had to keep his, his current job. Um, so how did we get out of that epoch, that period in the 1970s and early 80s of, you know, very high inflation? Yeah, so um, the high inflation of the 1970s and early 80s, um, in some ways it was similar to our recent high inflation episode, but it had a lot of differences, too. So. Um, it went along with also very high unemployment for a lot of the time, which more, more recently, you know, luckily we had high inflation, but the labor market was strong. Um, in the 70s and 80s, we had high inflation, but there was also a lot of it was driven by um, the um, oil shocks, yeah. and unemployment was high. Um, and monetary policy was quite different then. So um, policymakers in the 70s, um, 
they they thought they had you know found this uh, this trade off this curve called we call it the Phillips curve now. It's like a trade off between inflation and unemployment. And so Phillips, um, a British economist, he had plotted you know his dot plot showing when um, inflation is higher, unemployment is lower. And so that so everyone said, great, if we want <laughs> unemployment lower, we just need inflation a little higher, and that seems like a good trade off to make because. Who cares if inflation is like a little bit higher if we have unemployment lower? And, and there was a big push for full employment. Um, but that, the idea that the Phillips curve is like actually a menu of options for policymakers to choose from, um, that's, where it, that's where it went wrong. Because once people start expecting higher inflation, then inflation will actually be <coughs> higher even for a given level of unemployment. So as they tried to like push the economy to lower levels of unemployment, um, inflation was going higher and higher. And, and there was the bad luck of the oil shocks also. Um, and so to get out of that, like what you, what you really need is for people to actually expect low inflation again. And that's a, a really hard task. Um, for the Fed was, was following what's like called a stop and go policy where they would say, okay, you know, unemployment was high, but inflation was really high too. Okay, let's tighten a little and see if we can get inflation down. And they would tighten a little, inflation would start to fall, but unemployment's going up. Oh no, like reverse course. Um, so, so they were just like going bit by bit like that and not ever assuring people that they were actually gonna get inflation down. So inflation expectations were really unanchored um, and, um, yeah, it seemed like there was just kind of nothing to do about it. The, the Fed chair, Arthur Burns, actually told Nixon, what we need is incomes policy, which is what's the term they use for wage and price controls. The Fed chair himself said, we can't, the Fed can't do anything about this kind of inflation. Um, we need you to just use controls, which Nixon eventually did. Um, but it wasn't until um, Chairman Paul Volcker um, act, that the Fed actually like re or gained its credibility for keeping inflation low, and it was it was like a really costly thing for them to achieve. A shock to the system. Yeah, he had to say like we we're going to get inflation down like at whatever cost, basically. Um, so yes, interest rates were rising, unemployment was rising. Um, home builders were mailing wooden planks to Paul Volcker to express their <laughs> dissatisfaction, right? Because like you, your dad couldn't go buy a new house because mortgage rates were so high. That meant that they couldn't build new right. houses either. So everyone was mad at um, at Paul Volcker, but he was you know committed enough to say, like I think that we really can't get out of this mess in, in, until we get inflation down, um, even at the cost of a big recession. Yeah. Um, so that eventually worked, and by the mid 1980s, inflation was back down into the like low one digits. So with that, let's get us up to the current yeah. epic here. So we have this 30-year period of of bliss, if you will, when it at least comes to inflation, right? That we haven't had these inflationary moments. Um, some people thinking maybe we've solved inflation, right? right. Uh, and then, and then, of course, the last few years here. Uh, what, what happened? <laughs> why, why are we back to where? I mean, there are whole generations of people who have never experienced inflation in the United States, and yet here we are. Yeah, so after the Volcker um, disinflation, and I mean, he gave a speech called The Triumph of Central Banking, right? Mm. It's, um, inflation seemed to be conquered. Um, this was, the great inflation was like not just in the US, it was around the world and other countries um, they saw how Paul Volcker conquered inflation, and some of them began adopting um, a policy called inflation targeting. And it was based on this idea, like, what did we learn from the Volcker disinflation? Well, we learned that anchoring expectations is really important. And if you get people to believe that inflation is going to be low and stable, that actually helps inflation be low and stable. So some, of, some countries, starting with New Zealand, said, let's make this um, explicit, and New Zealand said, okay, we are going to target 2% inflation, and that's going to be our main objective. Um, and that was picked up by dozens of countries, like in the 
1990s, 2000s. Not the US, although um, Ben Bernanke, who before he was Fed chair, was a big proponent of inflation targeting. Um, the Fed was like implicitly inflation targeting. So if you, you know, Fed watchers all thought that the Fed secretly had an inflation target. They just, they just didn't want to announce exactly what it was. But in 2012, the Fed did make it like official. They announced that they had a 2% target for PCE inflation. Um, and inflation was actually below that target by a little bit um, for many years. So um, yeah, when I was in grad school um, doing my PhD, that was um, between 2010 and 2015. And the big topic that everyone was talking about is like, inflation is too low, inflation expectations are too low. What can the Fed do to engineer higher inflation expectations? How can they um, use expectations as a policy tool? Like the Fed still, this was when the Great Recession was over. Um, and but rates were almost the, rates were zero. zero, right? The Great Recession was like technically over, but unemployment was still high. So the Fed wanted to um, still stimulate the economy. They thought, we still need more aggregate demand. We can't cut interest rates because they're already at zero. But if we get inflation expectations up, that's the same thing as lowering interest rates. It, it just um, it reduces real interest rates. So they wanted inflation expectations higher. And they started doing you know, all they could to try to communicate with the general public more. Um, but yeah, it, it, inflation itself and inflation expectations were just stubbornly low. And that was like, now it's like, oh man, inflation is 1.8, what was that? <laughs> right. um, but they, they were worried that it would be a problem because um, what if we slip into deflation? And yeah. what if we have another recession and interest rate, we don't have any room to cut interest rates because they're already so low. Um, so yeah, they, that was really the big um, issue. And the Fed does, did a review of its framework um, in 2019 and 2020. Um, the framework is where they have written down um, about their inflation target and um, what, they kind of, what they kind of think about their mandate. So they did a framework review. As part of the review, they went um, around the country doing this Fed Listens tour. So they were talking with different, um, I guess you'd call them stakeholders of monetary policy. They were talking with consumer groups, labor groups, um, associations of retired people, and so on, asking, what do you think about inflation? What do you think about full employment? Um, what do you think about what the Fed's doing? And everyone was telling them, um, you know, we don't, we're not worried about inflation. What we really need is full employment. Mm -hmm. What we really need is, yeah, just do not, um, you know, don't kill our recovery by worrying about inflation that hasn't even materialized yet. Because the, the concern was that the Fed- This was pro, uh, pre-COVID? Like pre-COVID, yeah. yeah. Unemployment was, was very low, like around 4%. Inflation was very low, but the worry was that the Fed was gonna um, say, well, because, because unemployment is so low, that's probably going to push up inflation. So we should act preemptively and raise rates. And that is the, the strategy that the Fed had been following, like a kind of preemptive strategy. So you're not responding to the inflation you're actually experiencing, but you're responding to the inflation that you are forecasting is yeah. going to happen because monetary policy um, works with a lag. Um, but all these groups in the listens event said, don't do that. Inflation's not even here yet. It might never come, and but full employment is so good for us. So so we're not um, you know we're not worried about inflation. And in the Fed listens reports, there's um, there's a great quote about like the only people who um, care about inflation are like are old people, like retirees. Yeah, there we around. go. <laughs> <laughs> um, We've experienced it. it yeah. It, 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 that wasn't the exact quote, but that was pretty close to it. Yeah. Basically, only old people care about inflation. Okay, so the Fed does this event, all these listening events, and then they amend their framework review during COVID. Um, and it maybe didn't sound like much. Instead of saying we're targeting 2% inflation, so we're targeting 2 inflation that averages 2%. Mm -hmm. And that if we, so they adopted what's like called a makeup strategy. If we, um, 
if we undershoot our inflation target, right, if we go below 2% inflation, we're going to make up for it by then aiming for higher than 2% inflation, but not the opposite. So it was an asymmetric makeup strategy. If we overshoot 2% inflation, we bygones be bygones. Okay. Um, and that was made from a time of thinking, well, what can we do to get inflation up and to get inflation expectations up? And if you want to get inflation expectations up, that should do it, right? Because then if, if you accidentally get too low inflation, everyone now is supposed to expect, oh, maybe they'll do 3 or 4% inflation next because we just had 1% inflation. Um, but it was, it was asymmetric, and it also sort of um, took away that idea of uh, responding preemptively. So um, I think then when, when the rise in inflation in 2021, 2022 was happening, one is, okay, we're not going to try to make up for it by going below target, but also <coughs> um, as inflation was starting to rise but not really above target yet, they didn't want to act too quickly. Mm -hmm. They wanted to give inflation time to like make up for the past undershoots. Okay. So if it, it most likely slowed down, right? How Did they underestimate then, in your opinion, the amount of inflation we would see, the rate and the increase, or again? Um, I mean, everyone, I think everyone underestimated it. It depends upon like what time the forecast is being made. Yeah. In 2020, everyone underestimated inflation. Mm -hmm. um, at some point in 2021, mm -hmm. people started, some people started getting worried about inflation, but that, um, yeah, there was this big debate. I don't know who, who was on Twitter saying hashtag team transitory, right, where people <laughs> were saying, is inflation transitory or not transitory? Um, and it, it really became a heavily political debate where it was pretty clearly like um, more progressive leaning economists and, and politicians were saying it's transitory because if you were to say it's not transitory, that means you want higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. Right, which, um, yeah, so it, it became pretty political. And, and you can look at like the Fed saying it's transitory into 2021, but that doesn't tell you what they actually were forecasting because they also have to just worry about public expectations. So they might, might have a, a reason to not give us their, their true forecast. Yeah. Right? I want to make sure everyone has a chance to ask questions here. So get your questions ready, uh, and, and I will take them. But I have a, you know, just a couple more for you before we open it up. Um, we just had all the Fed reduce rates by a half point yesterday. Yes. Um, are we done? Are we, are we back? Are we, are we, can you give us another 30 years of uh, yeah. you know, low inflation, <laughs> or, or um, where are we currently stand? Yeah, my, my plane, my first flight landed in Atlanta at like 1.55. <laughs> the announcement was at 2 p.m. So I, of course, turn on my phone, I'm like looking around, <laughs> who else is going to follow the Fed? And everyone's like playing Candy Crush. And I'm like, you guys, the Fed's going to make it this historic announcement. And, you know, I wait and it's like 50 basis points. I'm thinking, wow, like, who, who can I talk with? No, nobody cares. <laughs> um, but anyway. This is like my wife and I at the beach, right? Like, I'd be all excited, and she'd be like, why are you, why are you concerned about this? 50 basis points, yeah, which is pretty unusual because they normally only have done, they normally cut by, like, cut or raise by 25 basis points, um, a quarter percentage point at a time, and they try to, like, kind of move gradually that way. Only during big, um, like, at the start of COVID, they did bigger cuts. At the start of the Great Recession, yeah. they did bigger cuts. So this was kind of unusual that they made such a big um, cut in what seemed like pretty normal um, times. They signal that they're not done. They um, probably are cutting another half a percentage point this year, whether that's like one 50 basis point or two 25 basis points, um, we don't know. Do you think they're targeting? I mean, I know, again, they don't explicitly say necessarily, but are they, are they trying to get back to that, like, 2% two, 2 range? 2% inflation, for sure. They haven't, yeah. um, they haven't touched their 2% inflation target. Okay. I don't think they're going to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so they, after their meetings, they published the summary of economic projections. It shows what they project for inflation, unemployment, interest rates, and a couple other things over like the next couple of years. And their projections show like interest rates going down a little, inflation going nicely back to 2%. Yeah. Um, and, but that's all subject to like no other 
unforeseen major shocks hitting. So if we have another, like, God forbid, pandemic or war or something like that, I mean, then who, basically who knows. But yeah. if things kind of continue as normal, um, yeah, they're going to still be trying to keep inflation at 2%. Yeah. Um, and interest rates, I think, will be a little lower than they are now. So even if the, uh, if the economy and the economists are like, we've got it right, the politicians are still talking about this episode yeah. that we recently have. So I'll, I'm going to give you two questions, one from each of our presidential sure. candidates here. So former President Trump uh, has argued a number of times that Fed independence is not appropriate and the president should have basically control over monetary policy. Mm-hmm. What's your thoughts on that idea? Um, yeah, I think that's a bad idea. <laughs> um, don't worry, I already can predict. I'll think Paris's policies are a bad idea. Too. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking <laughs> but, too. Um, no, I think it's a bad idea because um, look, part of the reason you want the Fed or the, the monetary authority to have political independence is you need them to have like a longer time horizon yeah. than um, a politician would have. Politicians care very much about the next election or even the next like midterm um, or just about how, what people think of them right now. And if you want to make the economy like good right now, you have looser policy. Mm-hmm. You um, cut interest rates. You give everybody a stimulus check. You know, that helps people feel really good right now. It brings inflation, but that's a little farther down the road. Um, and also people might not actually know that the inflation came from the stimulus checks mm-hmm. or came from the lower interest rates. So if you leave like interest rates in the hands of the president, any president, whether you like them or not, they're going to probably um, cause a lot of inflation. Juice up the economy for yeah. short term gain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's why like that's the main theoretical reason for leaving monetary policy in the hands mm-hmm. of like an independent agency. Um, But of course, you know, it needs to have the appropriate accountability and congressional oversight. So to do the other side, Vice President Harris has come out and said price controls on uh, groceries and other kind of critical goods uh, and specifically saying there's been price gouging uh, by companies. I think I know what the answer is going to be. What's what's your thoughts on this solution to this problem? um, Wasn't well a fan of the proposals for kind of anti-price gouging. Um, so first of all, like state governments almost all have anti-price gouging um, legislation already. I checked and Virginia does. Um, and it, like what Virginia's um, state level anti-price gouging laws prohibit um, sellers from charging un- unconscionably high um, prices during a time of declared emergency. Um, So one is like, what's the need for the federal government to do it if the states already do it? But even the the state's anti-price gouging laws, they have unintended consequences that actually make them a bad idea. So if you think about, um, like, there's a hurricane that hits. Um, And this actually happened, like, during Hurricane Katrina, right, uh, the places that were hit, they needed generators. And um, people from other states would put a, put a bunch of generators in their car and make a you know, cross-country drive to bring generators to Louisiana. But they had to charge a higher price for them to make up, recoup their costs of like getting these generators and driving across the country. Um, if there's a price, anti-price gouging law in place and they have to just sell the generator for the regular price, nobody's gonna do it. So you're gonna just not have generators in Louisiana. But if they're allowed to actually charge double and people um, who just been hit by the hurricane are willing to pay double, like, isn't it better to let them charge, um, charge double? Um, the, so just in general, the anti-price gouging laws seem like a bad idea because of those unintended consequences. And they don't, um, yeah, they don't, like, they don't then incentivize companies to have extra stocks build up of products in case of emergency, right? If you know that if an emergency happens, you're going to be able to, um, to charge extra, then you're like incentivized to actually have some stocks built up. Otherwise, you're not going to. So, um, but also, I think Harris was, was referring to like grocery stores right now price gouging. Mm-hmm. And grocery stores actually have lower profit margins than most other 
sectors, and their profit margins haven't um, been rising. So, and we're not in a state of emergency. So I, I'm not sure like why we're calling it price gouging um, versus just this is where we are because of supply and demand. Um, if you also make it, you know, if what you're worried about is like um, too much market power, then you also don't want to like pass these kinds of laws that say, well, you're not allowed to like in um, or increase the profits you're making because all that's going to do is actually prevent new entrants from coming in. So um, you're not going to make any you're not going to make any progress at reducing market power that way. Yeah, the, um, Rent control is the other. The other is like our, our landlords kind of price gouging on rent. Um, rent control, yeah, it's. I think it's questionable whether some of those policies are even constitutional. Mm. Um, and it's like if we have a housing shortage, I think the real way to address it is increase housing supply. Rent control is going to do the do the opposite because it's not going to. Um, not going to incentivize people to like maintain the housing that's already out there, and you might say, okay, well, the rent control is not going to apply to new units, so you know it's not going to affect whether people are willing to build new units. But yes, it will because if you see that um, rent control can just be kind of imposed at will, are you, that's going to make it much riskier to build a new housing unit. So um, I think that would also be really counterproductive um, when you're thinking about the supply of housing. I think it's interesting that you point out, like both in the housing and the grocery store instances, these are actually highly uh, unconcentrated industries. Like there could have been other ones, I don't know, airlines or something that you yeah. could pick on. You might be able to argue there's there's market power that's being exercised. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. we have antitrust um, divisions like to look into that. To already. deal with that. Yeah. All right, I'm taking too much time. Let me open it up to uh, your questions here. Yes. torn a little, I was going to ask a very similar question. Um, you have to excuse my, my doctor's in political science, so excuse the crude, qualitative <laughs> way I'm framing this. But I was kind of curious. Um, I was surprised in looking at the pandemic and the resulting inflation from it that the literature in economics mostly suggests that, that unlike war, because it was this whole sort of, again, like a Twitter movement of like, this is kind of like a war, so we should have expected uh, inflation. And then looking into it more deeply, it turns out that classically or historic, historically, pandemics typically don't cause inflation, which really surprised me. Um, and the rationale I saw behind that was uh, like kinetic conflict destroys stuff, and yeah, it destroys people, but there's a lot of um, pent up demand afterwards to, to rebuild. Whereas a pandemic mostly destroys people and leaves infrastructure in place and drives down demand. Um, and I guess my question is how much of, like, what do you see as different with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic? I, I sort of have this nebulous theory about information technology and how it allowed uh, demand to stay quite high as we all kind of like work went, went remote. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so, um, you know, when the pandemic started, uh, nobody knew what it was going to mean for inflation because a pandemic, um, it, you can think of it as like an aggregate demand shock and an aggregate supply shock. So it stops people from spending and from wanting to spend. It reduces demand. Um, that tends to uh, lower inflation. But it also reduces production. Nobody, can, um, nobody mm -hmm. can go out and work. Supply chains get disrupted. That tends to increase inflation. So we don't know, you know on balance which one is going to... Um, which one's going to dominate. And that would be the case in earlier pandemics, too. Um, the, I think what's different from an earlier pandemic is, okay, like the government put its thumb on the demand side. <laughs> the, 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 the government said, let's increase demand a lot to counteract um, the decline in demand. So stimulus checks, really loose mon monetary policy. I don't think uh, the, I don't think in the, like, mm -hmm. um, Spanish flu, right? People were getting stimulus checks, or um, there was a, you know, a bunch of new lending facilities created. Right? Um, so, yeah, the inflation that eventually, um, that eventually happened, like a, a little while into the pandemic, right? 
you said pent up demand. Well, why was there pent up demand? Sure, partly it was that people didn't get to go get a haircut when there were lockdowns, and now they can go get a haircut. But it's also that, and also they have a bunch of stimulus money in their pocket to go spend. Um, so I think that's a big uh, difference. I'm curious just to follow up on that. Um, on the supply side, mm-hmm. uh, a much more globally integrated right. economy now than it was, you know, back in World War One or World War Two. Yeah. Um, is that contributing to it? Uh, is that you know we all talked about resilience and supply supply chains that we saw after after COVID? Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of the um, so the part of the inflation that came from the supply side did have a lot to do with the way that we have a globalized economy and there were supply chain um, disruptions and there were the the, um, the war between Russia and Ukraine that um, you know contributed to higher oil prices, higher commodity prices. Those all played a part in the inflation, um, but a lot of it was demand-driven, mm. and I think that had less to do with it. Interesting. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Um, you're talking about inflation, CPI, but then there's CPI, there's core CPI, I guess there's CPIU, <laughs> there's CPIE. Yep. Can you kind of talk about what those differences are? And in your opinion, do you think some of those should be used for some measures that they aren't now? Okay. For example, should CPIE be used for Social Security increases? Okay. Mm. Yeah, so um, a lot of the time I was just saying inflation, when I, I probably should have been saying PCE inflation. Um, so that's the personal consumption expenditures price index, and that's the one that the Fed targets. The Fed targets headline PCE. Um, most of the rest of the government uses the CPI, so when they're indexing um, you know, parts of the tax code and benefits, um, those, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so the CPI versus PCE. Um, CPI tends to be uh, always a little higher than PCE, about half a percentage point higher normally, and that's because of um, it's kind of technical, but the the way they um, the way they adjust the weights that they put on different items. But um, yeah, CPI also um, puts a much higher weight on um, housing than the PCE does. The PCE includes some categories of spending that the CPI doesn't. The CPI is only stuff that consumers buy on their own behalf, but the PCE also includes stuff that is bought on consumers' behalf. So the big thing would be like employer sponsor, employee-sponsored health care. Yeah. So because PCE includes that extra stuff, then that means it has less weight to put on stuff like housing. So you can get big differences between them when housing is either um, growing a lot more quickly than other stuff or growing a lot more slowly than other stuff. Um, now, core versus non-core or headline. And you can, have, you can have core CPI or core PCE. Core just means a measure that um, strips some parts out. And the parts that's normally stripped out are food and energy because those um, tend to be more volatile. Not that they tend to always be higher or always be lower, it's just that they're more noisy, right? Um, so if, so like the Fed takes core PCE into account when they're thinking about where inflation is likely to go because it's like a clearer signal. It strips out some of the noise. Um, and then there's all sorts of other like super core measures that strip out even other stuff <coughs> or that um, you know, all the different regional feds have come up with their new measures of like trimmed median or trimmed mean, where they're they're basically just changing um, what things are included in the measure and how you weigh them and whether you are looking at the middle price change or some um, some mean of price changes, um, and they all sort of serve different um, different purposes. I mean, in I think the Fed looks at all these measures because they want to just see what can we learn from looking at all the different measures of inflation that we have. Um, but then, the, yeah, there is a big question about which ones, which ones should be used for, um, for policy, like for indexing um, the tax code. Because it matters a lot like if um, social security payments are um, adjusted for inflation, and the CPI is always half a percentage point 
higher than the PCE, um, then you know payments like that half a percentage point compounded year after year after year actually matters a lot. So um, there have been all these like presidential commissions through the years, like trying to say, are we actually measuring the cost of living right? And you know, often the Congress will get really excited because they'll say, like, aha, we've been calculating the CPI wrong, and this is going to balance <laughs> this is going to balance the budget because now we're not going to have to, um, you know, now we're going to not have to raise social security payments as much because we're going to calculate the CPI in a different way, right? Um, the you know AARP doesn't. I was going to say, yeah, the retirees that. love that. Yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> um, well, yeah, I don't have strong opinions on what what is the right one to use. I mean, the Fed likes the PCE for fairly technical reasons. Um, the news covers the CPI way more, so I think everyone everyone who vaguely knows what the inflation rate is right now is more likely to know what the CPI inflation rate is right now. But, but I think it's an interesting observation that if you think about the impacts of inflation are not uniform across the, the population. You started with you know farmers and how they think about credit versus the creditors. I think about like with, with having with housing prices. If you're a fortunate position like I'm in, my debt to equity ratio on my home has gotten you know much better uh, in this inflationary environment. If you're a 34 year old millennial and you're looking to buy your first home, is it, <laughs> um, this is a much more difficult you know housing environment to uh, to deal with there. So even thinking about the politics of the different generational impacts of these. Uh, of, of these inflationary episodes. Yeah, Bob. Uh, building on the last question, why a 2% inflation target? Yeah, so that's a really good question. What the, the usual answer is like because New Zealand did it and everyone else. <laughs> so we New love New Zealand. New Zealand, that's New Zealand right. picked a 2% inflation target in 1989, and um, most like uh, developed economies have picked pick something like that also. So that's the kind of short answer. Um, I've read through all the FOMC minutes when they had debates about should we target PCE or CPI, should we target core or headline, and what should the, what should the target be? And you, know, you would hear people saying, but our mandate is price stability. Isn't that 0% inflation? The argument was, well, but we actually measure inflation a little bit wrong um, because you know, we have these weights on each category of expenditure, um, and we resurvey people every couple of years and recalculate the weights. But in, in between, then, um, if one, like if um, pork becomes cheaper than beef, then people are going to shift more of their expenditure to that relatively cheaper thing. Um, but so, like, actual inflation of what they're actually buying is actually a little lower than what we end up measuring. Mm -hmm. And they thought that's probably something like 2%. So if we target 2%, um, that's actually consistent with price stability. The other um, argument you hear for having 2%, and you even hear this argument from people who want a higher target than 2%, is that um, we, uh, we want more like policy room, policy space. So um, the the higher inflation is, the higher nominal interest rates are. So the more room the Fed has to cut rates before hitting the zero lower bound. And you also hear, we really, really don't want um, deflation because deflation is, is bad. And I don't buy that one quite as much um, because I think deflation is, um, I mean, it's bad if it comes um, because aggregate demand is falling so low, but it can be good if it's coming from Productivity growth. So you wouldn't declare whether deflation or inflation, like which is worse? Um, they're, they're well, I don't both think bad. there's some like magical switch that like zero point one percent inflation is good and then negative zero point one is is um, disaster. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the arguments for we need a four percent inflation target or something are like, you know, we have this we're gonna um, we have this probability of hitting deflation if we do and this probability if we don't. Um, yeah, I think. I think it's a combination of all those things, though. When the Fed was discussing it, like pre-Great Recession, it, it was mostly about the measurement issues. Yeah. We had a question over here. Uh, hello. Thank you for your great talk. I have a question about one American institution you didn't talk too much about, and it's uh, the Congress. Obviously, Congress cannot set money supply demand targets, things like that, but it can shape global and national demand and supply of goods and services. 
I'm thinking about the 1960s and, and American investment in its, mil its military expenditures in Europe and, and Vietnam, which had a big impact, obviously, on inflation in the 70s. So I'm curious whether, uh, in your research, you came up with a few maybe key moments since 1913 when Congress actually did consciously shape monetary policy, even though it's not necessarily what it usually does. If yeah, all. So, so great question. Um, yeah, and when the when I say that the Fed is independent, it's the way they write it on their website is like we're independent within government, not independent of government. And in particular, they're accountable to Congress. So Congress does play a, a big role in oversight of the Fed. Um, they have, um, I don't remember the, the years of these, but they, they have like introduced um, the Fed, you know, now has to do semi-annual testimony to Congress. And various um, members of Congress, like um, right, Patman and Henry Gonzalez, have um, tried to, like, I guess, really question the Fed and really make the Fed more transparent. Um, so, yeah, the the very the fact that like now um, we're able to go read um, old minutes and transcripts from the Fed, that's due to um, due to those members of Congress, like. They, um, they realized that, so the Fed was very, very secretive. They would have their FOMC meetings. Nobody knew what went on in there. Um, some members of Congress realized that there were actually videotapes of those, and they were saying the videotapes need to be public, and you know the, these FOMC meetings need to be fully transparent, fully publicly accessible. There's big arguments, you know, if it's, um, if the public can like see in real time what we're doing, we're not going to be able to have like free um, um, discussion in our meetings, and it's going to hamper our ability to like deliberate. Um, so they came to this compromise now, where we get a lot of the materials with like a five-year delay or a ten-year delay. Um, so I think Congress did have a big effect on making the Fed um, more transparent. They have also like the Fed, you know. They've amended the Federal Reserve Act, so um, uh, not very frequently, but um, the fact that the Fed has its price stability and full employment dual mandate, that comes from Congress. Mm -hmm. right? And um, I, th I think that if the Fed were to say, yeah, we are going to um, adopt a 4% inflation target, I think Congress could come in and say, but we gave you a price stability mandate, and we don't see that as consistent with price stability. And I'm not sure what what then would happen, but there is, like, in theory, there, there's some accountability there. Um, yeah, I, I'm very say I don't know how that works, right? So it's a presidential appointee approved by Congress. Approved by Congress but is yeah. there? I mean, could you remove someone from the the Fed governorship if um, they? It's aren't? very difficult. Yeah. yeah, I think there is. Would it be Congress or the president's the executive um, branch? I'm not totally sure. Yeah, there is like some ability to remove for for cause. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it works. Yeah. And it's different for the governors versus the reserve bank presidents. Too. Interesting. We have time for a couple more questions. Uh, thank you again for your talk. Uh, I learned today that people's expectation can drive inflation or can affect it. Oh. Mm -hmm. I learned today that uh, people's expectation can affect inflation. I'm curious, um, how much does the media, uh, social media, mm -hmm. disinformation, information, sort of, uh, did it drive this, this last period we've, we've just gone through? Yeah, so, um, so the idea is that like, if people expect higher inflation in the future, that's going to help bring about higher inflation now, because you, know, you might demand higher wages. Um, businesses might start setting higher prices now, because they expect that their competitors will be doing the same. Um, and you might, um, you might want to start spending now because you expect prices to be higher in the future, and that's going to you know, boost demand. Um, so that's the theory. There's actually, it's actually really hard empirically to tell whether this is happening. Um, so you know, macroeconomists, me and many others, try to figure out well, two things. One is. Like, can the Fed actually change people's inflation expectations by what it does or says? And then do, do those inflation ex expectations actually change their consumption in ways that affect inflation? Neither of those questions is very easy to answer because 
like the Fed is not just trying to change people's expectations at random. They're doing it when like the economy is bad and they want to boost things. Or um, yeah, so it's it's not like we have like experiments that we can really study. Um, but we do have all these surveys. Um, you might have heard of the Michigan Survey of Inflation Expectations, the, the Michigan Survey of Consumers, and they survey people's inflation expectations. Um, they could call any of you. They call like 1,000 people a month and get them, ask them about their inflation expectations back since 1978. Um, so I've worked with this data um, a lot, and I've also like kind of tried pairing it with data from the media to see um, to, yeah, to see how the media is covering inflation, how that affects expectations. And um, in the recent episode, one thing that was um, very no noticeable to me, and I wrote a paper about it too, is that there's this huge political polarization in inflation expectations. Mm -hmm. So in 2021 and 2022, when inflation was rising higher and higher, um, the inflation expectations of Democrats stayed perfectly flat, and those of Republicans rose a lot. And so when you see um, sometimes in the news like charts showing inflation expectations are rising or falling, it was 100% driven by Republicans. Mm -hmm. And so um, we did some analysis of media coverage on Fox versus CNN. And yeah, it was totally different narratives about what was going on, where um, you know they would both cover like um, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said inflation is transitory. Treasury Secretary Yellen said inflation is transitory, but can't she see that you know your groceries are blah blah blah? Um, so it was like totally split on party lines. Expectations were totally split on party lines. We tried to use it, this um, this split and the and the fact that like the share of Republicans is different in different states to figure out how much. Um, expectations actually contribute to inflation. And we did find a, a pretty sizable effect. <coughs> so um, redder states actually ended up with higher inflation, partly driven by the fact that people expected higher inflation. We're, we're running out of time, so I'm going to ask the last question. Uh, and a, a topical one, it may be very difficult to answer. So we have an election coming up. I think we're, what, how many days left? Less than 100 days uh, to, to the election at this point. Um, Will inflation play a big role in your mind by the time we get to that election date? Because I, my sense is that people are tend to be in the moment, like how they're feeling about the economy, like the day they're walking in to, you know, to vote. Um, again, if we're kind of beyond inflation now, at least that's what we kind of believe, will it still play into the psyches of, of voters? Um, yeah, I think that, well, what happens, like the one or two more CPI reports come out between now and November. I don't think that itself will matter very much. And I think people will just read that the way they want. So say we get a really good CPI report right before the election. Oh, inflation is back down, lowest it's been since the pandemic. Um, we're right on the Fed's target. Well, I think people already like made up their mind. That's not going to change any swing voters' mm -hmm. mind, probably. Uh, it's, it's definitely not going to change any already decided voters' mind. You'll either say, um, see, that proves that like the Biden-Harris administration has done great, or see, like my prices are still so high, so they're never going back down. That proves that the Biden-Harris administration is horrible. Like, you can just <laughs> take it, right, that CPI report. Um, the inflation that already happened in 2021, 2022, that um, probably did change people's opinions. So the people who were really hit by that maybe um, well, some of them probably blamed the Biden administration, um, and but others might have been convinced that it was started, like the seeds were planted under by the Trump administration, right? So, um, yeah, I think we're unlikely to that anything that happens with inflation between now and the election is going to change things much. I I was like on Twitter, seeing what was being covered about the Fed decision. And I saw some coverage from, I think it was like J.D. Vance rally, and a reporter said like something, the Fed has just cut interest rates by 50 basis points to alleviate inflation. What do you think about that? <laughs> and you know, is, it, is that what people think is going on? The Fed cut interest rates to alleviate inflation? Right. They cut interest rates because inflation is already down, and this, if anything, is supposed to bring inflation up again. 
So there's just like so much confusion about yeah. it that, um, yeah. On that high note, um, <laughs> please join me in thanking Carola for being here with us. Just, just a reminder that we have the books for sale, and, and are you signing some of them? And sure. shining books as well uh, outside in the hallway. But thank you all, and uh, thank you to the Karsh Institute for sponsoring this event. Thank you.